This breaking crime case is one of the most terrifying deaths I could imagine. Earlier this week on the 25th of March, a man from Pennsylvania was found deceased. The victim was 59-year-old Edward Whitehead Jr. and he was from Leighton. Police were called to the house and found Edward had been stabbed multiple times. He'd been attacked with a knife and a chainsaw. Now, a 30-year-old man named Zach Moyer was his neighbour. Police allegedly found Zach at a neighbouring house. They believe that he escaped out of Edward's house after the murder into the adjacent house. They later discovered disturbing CCTV footage of a man that they believe is Zach. The man was dressed in dark clothing and a scream mask. He was approaching Edward's house just before Edward was murdered. Investigators started questioning locals in the area and what they found was sickening. Zach's sister claimed that Zach had been talking about wanting to kill his neighbour the week before. Police have now arrested Zach on suspicion of Edward's homicide. The man in this photo is one of the worst sexual offenders in the history of Ohio. This man's name was Brian Peppers. For years, this photograph circulated on the internet attached to his story of sexual abuse and nobody believed that it was real. But some fact checking was eventually done and yes, Brian Peppers was a real man with a real peppered past. So Brian was born with something called Cruzon syndrome. And when Brian was younger, he was bullied incessantly by people in his school. So as Brian grew older over the years, his body quickly began to grow weaker and eventually his mental health deteriorated to such a point that he had to be checked into a nursing home. But it was in the year 1998 when Brian was arrested and convicted of molesting somebody. According to the report, he actually sexually abused the nurse that was taking care of him in the nursing home. Brian was then removed from the nursing home. He spent 30 days in jail and he was on probation for five years. After this incident, Brian was on the sex offenders registry in Ohio up until his death. When he died, Brian Peppers was only four foot one inches tall and he passed away on February 7th, 2012, which eerily enough is the day that I'm posting this TikTok and I didn't even realize it until I read that just now. There was a famous author named David and he wrote multiple best-selling horror novels. He was praised for plot twists and surprise endings. He received large amounts of fan mail every single day and many other authors sent him manuscripts in hopes that they will get their work published. But David took pleasure in stealing the ideas from amateur writers. If he came across a manuscript with a great idea for a story, he would use it in his own books and deny the author any credit. One day, David got a manuscript and as he read the first chapter, he felt he knew how it was going to end. He continued reading and as he got to the last chapter, he noticed the pages were stuck together. And anxious to finish the story, he pulled the pages apart. David felt increasingly tired, but still wanted to finish the story. When David finished, the ending was exactly what he thought. He then made a mental note to steal the story. But suddenly, David noticed a note from the author saying this. I knew you were going to steal this story. You did it to me before and blacklisted me from the whole industry and ruined my career and life. And now, I'm going to get my revenge. You had to pull the pages apart to read, didn't you? Are you feeling tired? That's normal. It's one of the symptoms of arsenic poisoning. Soon your heartbeat will get slower and slower until it stops forever. Goodbye, David. Some twist endings can be very hard to predict. This horrifying video depicts the death of a skydiver. In the video, Ivan Lester McGuire, the man holding the camera, jumps out of the airplane. But suddenly when the parachutes are deployed, Ivan discovers he didn't wear a parachute. So unfortunately, I couldn't find any photos of Ivan McGuire, the man who jumped from the plane, but this incident occurred in 1988 in California. On that day, Ivan was tasked with videotaping a skydiving instructor and a student while they embarked on a routine jump. Now, at the time, the plane was 10,500 feet above the surface of Earth. And the theory goes that Ivan thought he was wearing a parachute, maybe because he was tired, because he thought he already had it on. Ivan already had a recorded 800 jumps, so people knew he wouldn't just make a mistake like this. But either way, Ivan ended up jumping out of the plane and only realized mid-jump that he didn't have a parachute on. Obviously, he passed away once his body hit the ground. An investigation was opened up into the pilot of the plane because apparently pilots are always supposed to check on their passengers to make sure they have their parachutes on before they jump. But it was just a few tragic errors and miscalculations that day that led to this death. 
I'm going to show you the last moments of this footage right now. It's just absolutely disturbing and frightening to try to put yourself in his shoes and get into his mind, realizing that you're staring at the ground rapidly approaching you without a parachute. I just can't even begin to comprehend the terror he must have felt searching his back and staring down at the ground as it rapidly approached him. It's just so eerie. One fatal error meant this man was dragged by a roller coaster and thrown to his death. It was 2003 near Seattle in Washington. Doug McKay had been placed in charge of the family carnival business by his dad. Doug and his wife Sherry co-owned Paradise Amusements, which was based in Idaho. They ended up getting a contract with Whidbey Island Fair. On the 16th of August, the pair were at the fun fair inspecting the area. Doug noticed something needed fixing on one of the roller coasters. The ride in question was called the Super Loop 2. The ride was basically a vertical loop. Now, Doug felt that it needed lubricating on one side of the loop. Tragically, like he'd done many times before, Doug actually jumped onto the track while the roller coaster was in motion. Now, he was usually pretty good at this. He was very, very confident just hopping on and off the rides. However, as he sprayed oil onto the track this one day to lubricate the ride, he actually slipped and fell and got caught by his hair. He then became trapped on a carriage. Park goers watched on in horror as he was pulled 40 feet up to the top of the loop and then plunged to his death. Witnesses were then completely traumatized by seeing his body land on a metal fence and virtually split in half. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Horrifically, many children witnessed this as they were on the ride at the time. Now, the fair only postponed rides for an hour after the death. They then continued with the evening's amusements. The next day, the amusement park opened as usual. Doug's wife Sherry had promised Doug that if anything was to go wrong, she would keep the show running as usual. This couple were eaten alive by a grizzly bear captured on harrowing video footage. It was October 2003. Timothy Treadwell was a 46-year-old grizzly bear enthusiast. He famously claimed that he felt more at home in nature with the bears than in normal human society. He spent a total of 13 summers in Alaska's Katmai National Park documenting the giant creatures. He would stun people by how close he got to the giant animals. He said the animals understood him and that there was a mutual respect, and he would even occasionally wrestle with the baby cubs. Park rangers, though, were warning Timothy about how unpredictable the animals could be. This was what Timothy lived for, though. He seemed very willing to take the huge risk of getting up close and personal with these beautiful bears. Now, Timothy began to get complacent. On one occasion, he even left food open inside of his tent. Rangers had to warn him not to do this. Now, in the autumn in question, he was actually with his girlfriend, Amy, at the park. Now, they usually only stayed for the summer, but this year they were there much later into October. Bears are known to be a little bit more anxious and antagonistic this time of year as they are preparing for hibernation and food supplies are less. On the 5th of October, Timothy and his girlfriend were due to be picked up. They were getting a plane out of the national park, but when the pilot turned up, they were nowhere to be found. Near the campsite, the pilot stumbled upon something terrifying. A human rib cage lay on the floor. Park rangers were called and they were met by a terrifying bear. It tried to attack them, so they killed it. Human remains were later found in its stomach. They were the remains of Timothy and Amy. Timothy's video camera was later recovered from the campsite. The camera had captured the couple's brutal death. The audio from the camera was rolling and it picked up Timothy screaming that he was being killed out here. Amy then shouts at him to play dead and then encourages him to fight back. Tragically, they were both eaten by the grizzly bear. This is the Yellowstone accident, one of the worst ways somebody has ever died. Yellowstone is a very popular park and has a lot of visitors and accidents are extremely rare. But occasionally, some people will ignore the impact Mother Nature has and step off the designated trails and boardwalks to explore further. This was the case with Colin and Sable Scott. They disregarded many signs warning them to stay on the boardwalk and warning them that they were entering a thermal zone. However, thinking that they knew better, they ignored the warnings and looked for a place to swim. After walking several hundred yards off the trail, Sable and Colin found a small pool of water around six feet long, four feet wide, and 10 feet deep. 
Sable was recording the natural beauty of the area with her brother in frame. Colin kneeled down next to the pool of water in order to check the temperature. But as he reached down to check, Colin lost his footing and fell into the water. And immediately, Sable realized that they made a huge mistake. As soon as Colin hit the water, he let out a piercing scream. Sable, who was still recording, ran over to her brother in order to try and rescue him. However, it was to no avail. As her brother was boiling alive, Sable ran off to try and find help and found a park ranger. When they got back to the pool, Colin was already dead and floating face down. Park rangers attempted to recover Colin's body, but a thunderstorm arrived and forced them to retreat for the night. Returning the next day, they found that nothing of Colin's body remained besides his flip-flops and wallet. He had completely dissolved in the red-hot acidic water. Upon the investigation of Colin's death, Yellowstone officials asked for Sable's phone in order to get a copy of the video of Colin's death. Sable gave them permission to take her phone and get a copy of the video, and when they gave the phone back to Sable, Yellowstone officials stated to her that she should not watch the video and even asked her if they wanted them to delete it for her. However, she said no and that she wanted to keep the footage. She said she would never watch it but wanted to keep it, and nobody knows why. It's very unlikely this footage will ever be made public, and can you imagine falling into a boiling acidic body of water? and just floating there, burning and dissolving away, all while there is nothing anybody can do to save you. For all we know, Colin could have been alive for some time before dying, but nobody knows because his body dissolved away, and there was no autopsy. Luckily, the video of this never surfaced because I could only imagine seeing the pain he was feeling, and the regret his sister was feeling. There's no point to go looking for it because you literally won't find it. There's a lot of bad ways to die, but this has to be up there with the worst. Hamera. According to the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, I have known the story of real life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child, murderer and cannibal. Imagine being invited over for a study session only to be murdered and eaten by another student. This man literally killed and ate a human and never spent any time in jail. It was the 11th of June 1981 in Paris. Aisai Sagawa was a Japanese man studying in France. On the day in question, he invited a fellow student round to help him translate poetry for an assignment. The student was Dutch woman Renee Hartveld. She had no idea he had sinister plans for her. She also wasn't aware of his dark and depraved past. He planned to kill and eat her and his reasoning was that he felt that he was weak and ugly. She, on the other hand, was very healthy and beautiful. He thought if he ate her, he would take on her characteristics. When she showed up, he shot her in the neck. Horrifically, he then awed her body and tried to eat her, but realized his teeth weren't sharp enough. He decided to go out and come back with a sharp knife. Upon arrival back at the house, he ate part of her face, bum, feet, and neck. He then saved some of her body parts in his fridge. Now, as time went on, the rest of her body started to decompose. He panicked and took the rest of her remains over to a lake. Luckily, he was caught doing so and was found to have two suitcases with him filled with body parts. Now, this should have been the end of the tale and he should have gone to prison and served a lot of time for this hideous crime. It turned out, as a child, he'd experienced cannibalistic desires. When he was 24, he'd stalked a woman and followed her back to her apartment. He then broke in as she slept. Now, she actually woke up and fought back. He was arrested and charged with R, but actually had a wealthy dad who just paid off the victim. A few years later, in 1977, he went to study in Paris. He claimed he would often bring home S workers and intend to kill them, but just would freeze up. Now again, due to his wealthy family, when he got arrested for the horrific cannibal murder, he was able to afford a good lawyer. He was found legally insane and unfit to stand trial. He was then placed in a mental hospital for an unspecified amount of time. However, his case then started getting widespread media attention and he was actually deported back to Japan. It was in Japan he was declared sane. Now the charges in France had been dropped and he was released from hospital in 1986 and then was a free man. This was obviously heavily criticized by so many people. Staggeringly, he remained free until 2022 when he passed away from pneumonia in Tokyo, age 73.
This is Slaughterhouse, the ISIS video nobody should ever watch explained. The video that I'm about to explain depicts the brutal execution of 15 men and this graphic video was released on the 12th of December 2016. The video was filmed in a slaughterhouse in northeastern Syria and the 15 men that were executed were accused of spying on behalf of an international alliance led by the United States. The video is about four and a half minutes long and it opens up showing the captured men who are going to be executed. It shows them being apprehended, handcuffed, and then thrown into pickup trucks. The video then skips forward and you see the setting for the executions. It's a large slaughterhouse with meat hooks dangling from the ceiling. The captives are then moved into the building, essentially hurdled and moving like cattle to the corner of the room. All of the victims are on their knees, handcuffed in the corner, and then an ISIS member wearing all white approaches. And he then starts grabbing the heads of the victims and putting them down. It's like he's playing a sick game of eeny meeny miny mo. The killer then does this a couple times before he picks his first victim. The first victim is then dragged away from the group and laid down next to a blood drain. Immediately, one of the ISIS members takes a razor sharp knife and slashes the victim's throat. He is then hosed down by water as the blood goes down the drain. The camera focuses on the victim and even though there is loud music playing, you can still hear the victim gasping for a breath. It's also worth saying that these executions are filmed in HD which make them that much harder to watch. The first victim eventually passes away and is then hung by the feet on a meat hook so the blood can drain from his body. After the first execution takes place, the video then shows a montage of several men getting the same thing done to them, having their throats slashed and being left to bleed out. Many disturbing graphic shots are shown during this segment, including this one shot that had the camera in the drain so that you can see the blood flow and drain away. You also hear the sounds of the execution because there is no music in the background at this point. As the video continues, you see two men hung by their feet. However, unlike the other men, these victims haven't been executed yet. The camera then shows a close-up of the victim's face, and he looks content with his fate. Two ISIS members then simultaneously slash the two victims' throats who are hanging by their feet. At this point, you really see the reality of what's happening in this video. The slaughterhouse floors are completely covered in blood and you see 14 bodies hung by their feet on meat hooks like animals. At this point, there is one victim remaining. The victim kneels beside the executioner with a knife who reads a brief statement. The victim is crying and shaking as the reality of what's happening is settling in. Once the executioner finishes the statement, the final victim is lied on the floor and has his throat slit like the other 14 victims. But the final victim had a lot more struggle as his throat was being slashed. His legs were waving around in a last attempt to get away from the executioner. He then bleeds out and the final body is then dragged away in a cinematic nature. And this is where the video concludes. Just like all ISIS videos, the production and quality is extremely high level. They film these executions in a movie type style and nobody understands why ISIS makes the videos like this. But many people think it's to recruit new members. It's like they try to make these videos look appealing which is just very strange. Never go looking for this video for obvious reasons and this is just another example of how cruel our world actually is. It's crazy that human beings do these types of things to each other on a daily basis. It's absolutely sickening. Sometimes to understand your addiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders gradually progressed in violence, began with drive by shootings, and culminated in acts of cannibalism. There should be no odd against killing people. I know it's a wrong thing, but. Hell, hell, you restrict somebody from it, they're going to want it more. We found our victim, and sad as it may be, she's our... The two teenage boys who filmed that video, Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik, then went on after recording that to murder their classmate. Their classmate's name was Cassie Jo Stoddard, and this is an infamous case from Idaho. So Brian and Tori were obsessed with horror movies. They specifically loved the movie Scream. And in home recordings that the two actually made before the murder, they talked about how they wanted to create a real-life horror movie. Well, on September 22, 2006, these two decided that their first victim would be their 16-year-old classmate, Cassie Jo. And on that day, they created a death list of other people they wanted to murder as well. That night, Cassie Jo was house-sitting for her aunt and uncle at this property shown above. It's rural, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, and it was the perfect place for a crime. So on that evening, Cassie actually had her boyfriend Matt over. 
And at some point during the night, Brian and Tori, the killers, who were actually friends of the couple, came over for a tour of the house. Cassie had no idea that while those two teenagers were in her home, one of them had gone downstairs and unlocked the basement door so that they could come back later. At some point later on in the night, Brian and Tori returned to the house wearing creepy masks. They then proceeded from the basement to turn off the power in the home, shutting off all of the lights. The two were hoping that Cassie and her boyfriend would come down to check on this, but neither of them did, so they turned the lights back on. At one point, Cassie's boyfriend even noticed that the dog was staring down in the basement, and he thought this was suspicious. And that evening, Matt, Cassie's boyfriend, called his mother to see if he could spend the night with Cassie because she felt so scared. Matt's mom said that Cassie could come over to their house with him, but he couldn't spend the night. But Cassie assured Matt that she would be fine, so she sent him on his way, and she was alone in the home. When Matt's mother came to pick him up from Cassie's house, he actually called one of the killers. And when Tori picked up the phone, he was whispering. Now, Matt assumed that's because these two were in a movie theater, but they were actually in Cassie's basement. At this point, their plan was a go. The two started coming up from the basement. They slammed the door to the basement to scare Cassie, and then they attacked her, stabbing her 30 times. It was said by the person who discovered Cassie's body that this was an extremely gruesome, graphic, and horrific scene. After the murder, these two sped off in their vehicle, recorded all of this, and then disposed of all of their clothing, the weapon, the masks, at a nearby nature area called Black Rock Canyon. Eventually, they led investigators back to dig up what they had buried, and what they found was disturbing. This is the murder weapon, and this is an example of one of the masks that these two were wearing when they murdered Cassie. Now, thankfully, both of these two got life in prison without the possibility of parole. But to end this TikTok, I'm going to show you the rest of that video they recorded after they murdered Cassie. Let me warn you again, this is really disturbing stuff. Our first victim is going to be Cassie's daughter. She's going to be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? I, I mean, like, holy shit, dude. I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah. I was nine... 50, September 22nd, 2006. We know there's lots of doors. There, there's lots of places to hide. I locked the back doors. That's all locked. Now we just gotta wait. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, oh I just God. killed Cassie. One of the scariest things that I've ever heard is the voicemail that Henry McCabe left his wife before he mysteriously disappeared. On the evening of September 6, 2015, Henry was partying with some friends at a club called Publitsky's in Minnesota. At this time, Henry's wife and two kids were staying with some family in California, so they weren't in town. When they were done partying, for reasons unknown, Henry's friend William dropped him off at a gas station at around 2 a.m. The following events that took place have never really been explained. At 2.28 a.m., Henry's wife gets a call from Henry, and at first it kind of seems like a pocket dial but the sounds are literally terrifying. It sounded like he was moaning in pain, almost like growling noises, and you can't really make out what he's saying, although some believe that it sounded like he said he'd been shot. After two minutes of these horrifying sounds, a man yells, stop it, and then the call disconnects. Only part of the voicemail has ever been released. Here it is. Not long after this call, Henry also called his brother and left him a voicemail too. This time, he was crying. Henry disappeared after this, and when he didn't show up for work the next day, he was reported missing to the Mounds View Police Department. At the start of the investigation, police talked with Henry's friend William, who dropped him off at the gas station that night. To their surprise, William had Henry's keys and wallet, and he says this is because he was trying to stop Henry from driving that night. William also tells the police which gas station he dropped Henry off at that night, and authorities immediately began looking for him. But after reviewing 
reviewing surveillance footage, it turns out that William told police the wrong gas station. Thanks to that surveillance footage, they found that William actually dropped Henry off at a holiday gas station in the complete opposite direction in Fridley. This made more sense considering the area where his phone last pinged and sent that voicemail was in the vicinity of Creekview Park in New Brighton. So they then shifted their search area to this location, but it was like Henry vanished into thin air. There was no activity on his bank accounts, and he wasn't showing up to his job as a Department of Revenue auditor, which he loved. So that, paired with the horrifying voicemail that he left his wife that night, led authorities to believe that he was met with foul play, and even the FBI got involved. But there was literally no evidence of anything happening. There were so many searches for Henry, but every one of them turned up nothing. But then, two months later, someone kayaking on Rush Lake in New Brighton spotted something in the water. When police arrived, they discovered Henry's body and he'd been in the water for quite some time. Despite his voicemail and him saying that he'd been shot, there were absolutely no signs of trauma to his body. The autopsy indicated that Henry possibly died from drowning, but as far as I can find, his manner of death remains undetermined. Some things just don't really add up in this case though, like the location of the club he was at that night, to where his phone last pinged and sent that voicemail, to where he ended up in the water. And the biggest question I have is how did he get in the water? The gas station that he was dropped off at that night was six miles from the lake. Google Maps says that it would have taken him almost two hours to walk there, but he sent that voicemail at 2.28 in the morning, just minutes after being dropped off. If he tried to walk and got lost and just fell in the water, how did he get there so fast? And why did William drop him off at a gas station instead of his own house that night? The lake was within minutes of Henry's house, but if you remember, William kept his keys and wallet. So Henry essentially had no way of getting inside of his house, and he didn't have any identification on him if something were to happen. Those who knew Henry say he would never intentionally hurt himself. He was married for 11 years, had a job that he loved, and had two beautiful kids. Whatever truly happened to Henry McCabe and caused him to leave that horrifying voicemail that night remains a mystery nine years later. This is one of the worst true crime cases I ever covered, and this is a massive trigger warning. In 2007, the boy on the right named Gabriel Kuhn, who was 12 years old, was killed by Daniel Petrie, who was 16 and on the left. Daniel Petri and Gabriel Kuhn became good friends and began playing an online role-playing game called Tibia. At one point of the game, Gabriel asked Daniel for 20,000 virtual cash to clear the stage. Gabriel borrowed money from Daniel to use in the game and then refused to pay him back. Gabriel then blocked Daniel on everything and this made him furious and he went to Gabriel's house to pay him a visit. A couple of days before the murder, Daniel called the home phone of Gabriel and his mom answered. She explained that she would be out of town and that her son would be home alone if they wanted to play, completely unaware of the boys falling out. And on August 23rd, 2007, Daniel went to Gabriel's house and knocked on the door. Nobody answered and Daniel kept knocking, but eventually Gabriel started speaking to Daniel through the door. Daniel told Gabriel to unlock the door and let him in, and if he apologized to him, everything would be fine. Believing this, Gabriel unlocked the door and let Daniel in. And after entering the house, Daniel locked the door behind him. Daniel then brutally assaulted Gabriel. Gabriel tried his best to defend himself, but he failed to do so. Daniel was older, bigger, and stronger. Gabriel was dripping in blood after being brutally beaten by Daniel. Daniel then laughed at the terrified Gabriel and took him to the bedroom, where he then sexually assaulted him. Gabriel cried, but this made Daniel even more cruel. After all of this, Gabriel threatened Daniel, saying he will tell his mother everything that happened, but this only made Daniel more mad. And in a fit of rage, Daniel took a cord from a gaming console and wrapped it around Gabriel's neck and strangled him with it until he went limp. Daniel assumed Gabriel was dead, and believing this, Daniel tried to move and hide the body in the crawlspace, leading to the bedrooms. However, the body was too heavy, and after realizing this, Daniel searched the house for sharp tools and eventually he found a kitchen knife and a hacksaw. Daniel then returned to Gabriel's body and in order to make it lighter, he took the knife and hacksaw and began cutting at the top of Daniel's leg to remove it and as Daniel cut into Gabriel's leg, he woke up. Gabriel wasn't dead. He let out a blood curling scream but Daniel restrained him making sure to twist and turn the blade to make it even more painful. Eventually, Daniel dismembered his right leg and moved to his left. And after severing both of his legs, Gabriel passed away. His autopsy suggested he was still alive throughout the whole ordeal and he eventually died from shock and blood loss. After Daniel finished the dismemberment, he tried to hide the body again and he wrapped a cable and wire around Gabriel's body. But the body was still too heavy and Daniel then fled the house. Gabriel's body was discovered by his brother and the body was left by the hallway door and the legs and the hacksaw too. 
Daniel Petri was admitted to a juvenile center in September 2007 to only three years. This is due to Brazil's laws of sentencing minors. And to make you realize how evil Daniel was, when the judge asked him if he had any last words of remorse, Daniel said this, Gabriel was a coward and a thief. He burns in hell right now where I sent him. And when I die, I will find him in hell and finish my revenge. It's also worth saying that the photos of the crime and Gabriel's body have surfaced on the internet and nobody knows how they got there. I highly recommend not to look at them due to the graphic nature of them and they will definitely be the worst crime scene photos you will ever see. It's honestly insane how Daniel is walking free today. May Gabriel rest in peace. To take you to join a call. This fully reminds me of a story I read about a guy that joined a doomsday cult by accident. A few years ago, a guy, Alex, was studying law in Australia when he was approached by two men in suits on campus. They told him they needed to interview international students for a study they were doing. Alex does the study and the guys are really nice and Alex doesn't really have any friends on campus, so they ask him to coffee later and he accepts. So on the day they're supposed to meet for coffee, the two guys end up bringing this like other woman along. And they're all hanging out, but she starts talking about these classes that she's been taking. She's raving about these classes and the guys have also taken these classes and they're like, Alex, you have to do these classes with us. So when he shows up to take the class with them, it turns out it's a nine month commitment and you have to go three times a week. Also, it's a full on Bible study. But Alex was raised Christian and he also doesn't want to lose these friends. So he's like, whatever, I'll take these classes with you. But then a few months into these classes, his friends start saying weird things to him like, oh, your parents are under the control of Satan. You should probably not talk to them anymore. Alex gets a weird vibe. He ends up Googling it and it turns out he fully joined Shinchenji, which is a high control religious group based in South Korea. He took a bullet to the head in broad daylight while serving as the president of the United States. I am John F. Kennedy, and here is the account of the curse that befell my family. I was born in 1917 into a wealthy and influential family. My father, Joseph Kennedy, had grand ambitions for us, his children. However, shortly after I assumed the presidency as the 35th president of the United States, misfortune began to plague my family. My elder brother, Joseph Kennedy Jr., was killed during World War II. My sister Kathleen perished in a plane crash. And then came that fateful day in 1963, when I was assassinated in broad daylight in Dallas. But the curse did not end there. My brother Robert was assassinated in 1968 while campaigning for the presidency. My other brother Edward survived a plane crash in 1964, but was involved in a tragic car accident in 1969, resulting in the death of a young woman. And the list goes on. My nephew, John F. Kennedy Jr., lost his life in a plane crash in 1999. My sister, Rosemary, lived a tragic life after a lobotomy. The curse of the Kennedy family seems to have no end. I don't understand how an argument over breadcrumbs can cause someone to do something so heinous to someone else. 35-year-old Dimitri Fricano stabbed his girlfriend, 28-year-old Erica Preti, to death after she called him out for leaving breadcrumbs on their hotel bed. In 2017, they were on vacation in San Teodoro when on one of those nights, Dimitri attacked Erica and stabbed her 57 times. Dimitri was originally sentenced to 30 years in prison, but what happened next, no one saw coming. You see, when Dimitri was sentenced in 2018, he weighed about 260 pounds. Then from 2022 to 2023, Dimitri gained 200 pounds and now weighs about 450 pounds. So because of his health and the horrible diet served in prison, Dimitri was recently released after only serving five years. The court ruled that the food in the prison could end up killing him, so he had to get out. And get this, Dimitri will serve the rest of his sentence under house arrest at his parents home near Milan where he can get access to a healthy diet. So this is a slap in the face to the victim's family but keep in mind this happened in Italy so I'm guessing the laws over there are a little bit more lenient. So do you guys think his release was valid or should he have been kept there for the remaining of a sentence? Killed more than 33 young men. I was nicknamed the killer clown. My name is John Wayne Gacy. I had a particularly difficult childhood because of my father who was a very violent and authoritarian man. At the age of nine, I was raped by a person I thought was my friend. I then left school very early and immediately joined the Navy. I quickly stopped and chained several jobs. I even had my own construction company. And that's how I attracted young men by promising them jobs before committing the worst. I also worked in a funeral home. I quickly took a liking to it. And this experience contributed to fuel my fascination for death and the macabre. I 
two children in the meantime, and I got married. I was innocent and benevolent in appearance towards everyone, but unfortunately I had murderous impulses. To satisfy these impulses, I used my clown costume to sexually assault them, rape them, and bury my victims at home without anyone suspecting me of where my nickname of Killer Clown came from. This lasted for many years, until the police finally suspected me because of a foul smell reported by the neighbors. I was then arrested. I pretended that I was crazy and that everything I did was due to madness, but I was arrested in 1978 and sentenced to death in 1994, and that's how the nightmare I inflicted on many people ended. You will genuinely never guess what happened after this man was kidnapped by armed, masked men. Rogelio Anderverdi was 34 and from Edinburgh, Texas. At 10.30pm on the 1st of October 2013, a terrifying event would unfold. Rogelio was at home with his wife when suddenly two masked men with guns barged through the door. They dragged the man from the property and forced him into the back of a van. His wife was understandably hysterical and called police immediately as the masked men disappeared with her husband. Now, police officers headed out in force and even had a police helicopter scouring the area for any sign of him. However, they had no luck and police became suspicious as Rogelio had no criminal history or links to any gangs of any kind. After several hours, the search was called off. Two days later, to his wife's shock, Rogelio walked through the door. He told her that his kidnappers had shown him mercy and simply set him free. Now, obviously, the police were following up on this case and they questioned him. Eventually, Rogelio had to tell the truth. He had staged a fake kidnapping between him and his friends so that he could go on a night out. He said that he simply wanted to spend time with his friends and party. He was eventually charged with making a false report to police and released on $5,000 bail. That was a shocking footage of 21-year-old Angel Lynn being kidnapped in broad daylight by her boyfriend, Che Boskill. She was thrown inside the van and then driven down the A6 and at 60 miles an hour, she was pushed from the van and suffered a catastrophic head injury. She was found by a passerby and rushed to hospital. Angel suffered a fractured skull and a catastrophic brain injury from which she might never recover. She was left unable to walk, talk or feed herself. Che was arrested and charged with kidnap, coercive and controlling behaviour and perverting the course of justice. It couldn't be proven that he'd pushed Angel from the van and he received seven and a half years. This was later extended to 12 years. The driver of the van was also sentenced to 21 months. Angel, on the other hand, has a life sentence after doctors have told her mum that she's unlikely to ever recover from her brain injury. It's now a couple of years on and Angel's mum said she is able to communicate slightly. She still can't walk or talk but uses a communication machine and she can understand everything that's being said to her. When she puts her cheek against her daughter's lips, Angel purses her lips to give her a kiss. She hopes one day that she'll be able to communicate enough to tell everybody what actually happened on that fateful day. This Derbyshire crime case is horrific. Police were called to a house in Killamarsh in 2021. It was 7.26am on the 19th of September. What they were told when they arrived stunned them. Outside was Damien Bendel. He chillingly told police that he'd murdered four people inside of the house. He was arrested at the scene and what officers discovered would haunt them. 35-year-old Terry Harris had lived in the house along with her children, 13-year-old John Paul Bennett and 11-year-old Lacey Bennett. Also deceased inside the property was Lacey's best friend, 11-year-old Connie Ghent, who'd been there for a sleepover. Damien and Terry had been in a relationship after meeting on a dating website. Prior to the murders, and this is a massive, massive trigger warning for animals here, Damien had bragged that a friend couldn't afford to take their dog to the vet, so he'd killed it using a brick. He was a known substance user and used a lot of CO and CA. On the day in question, the four victims were found deceased in the house with their skulls crushed. He had awed 11-year-old Lacey as she died. After the killings, he went to town to get more substances and was spotted on CCTV going to a shop to buy tobacco. He took John Paul's Xbox and traded it in for substances. 
When making polite conversation with Damien, a cab driver reported that he told him his night had been a bit mad. He was given a whole life order in prison and the house has since been demolished. These are videos humans were never meant to see. Okay, so we all remember the devastating tsunami that hit Japan on March 11th, 2011. But the footage I'm about to show you, you've probably never seen. This is super rare footage of the tsunami that day and it's absolutely crazy. Just look how quick and destructive the water is. It's absolutely terrifying. You'd never think that these are the faces of two 12-year-old killers, but that's exactly what they are. Jake Eakin and Evan Savoy were 12 years old and lived in the small town of Ephrata in Washington. They were described by parents as soft-spoken and nice boys. On February 15, 2003, they decided to go and call on another boy to see if he wanted to come out and play. Nobody could have predicted the horror that they were planning. Craig Sauger, 13, was at home with his mum when the two boys knocked on the door. His mum answered and was surprised to see them standing on the doorstep. Craig didn't get invited out to play much, he was on the spectrum and didn't really get included with the other boys. She happily let him go out to play but told him to come back before it got dark. As night fell, Craig's mum began to get worried and she decided to go out and look for her son. She called on Jake and Evan's parents and found that they were both already home. They said that they'd left Craig in the park and that he was going to walk home by himself. She headed to the park and to her horror, she found her son's lifeless body buried under a pile of leaves. She called for an ambulance, but it was already too late. Craig was dead. Jake and Evan's story was that Craig was climbing a tree when he fell. They freaked out and ran home and left him there by himself. The next day, after finding blood on the boy's shoes, the parents turned them into police. Craig's autopsy showed multiple stab wounds, five to his chest and torso and 34 to his head and neck. Both of the 12-year-old boys were arrested and tried for Craig's murder. They were treated as adults in court due to the severity of the crime. They became the youngest murder defendants in the state to be tried as adults since 1931. Jake testified against Evan and said that it was him that had told Craig to bend down and count to 10 before dropping a massive rock on his neck. He then began stabbing him and it was then that Jake joined in with the murder. Jake was convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to 14 years in prison. And Evan was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to 20 years. The shocking thing about this story is that both boys were released in 2020 and are now grown men and are married and living normal lives. These are people who have gone missing in 2023. This is Joshua Amos who is 32 years old. He has been missing since March 19th, 2023 after leaving a strip club in Washington Park, Illinois. His mother, Christine Simpson, said his disappearance is something that Joshua just wouldn't do. He was seen on video leaving Scarlet Strip Club on Berkman Road in Washington Park at 5 a.m. on March 19th. Surveillance cameras from a trucking company on Lincoln Avenue captured Joshua's image at 7.28 a.m. that day. The trucking company and the strip club are about four miles apart. Illinois State Police and a search dog looked for Joshua on March 24th, 
But nothing was ever found. His family and friends continue the search to this day, hoping they will find him ever since his disappearance. Up next is Jordan Taylor, and at 4.18 p.m. on January 6, 2023, Jordan Taylor, who is 29, changed his Facebook profile picture to a selfie of him wearing a white mask. Later that day, Jordan went to a barber shop located on Hillside Avenue in Queens, New York, and at 6.48 p.m. he abruptly left in the middle of his haircut, telling his barber that he had to go after receiving a phone call. Jordan was later seen standing outside of the barber shop for 5 to 10 minutes. Around 9 p.m. that same day, phone records show that Jordan went to the Port Authority bus terminal, where he seemingly spent some time up until midnight. On January 7th, 2023, phone records track Jordan to a location near a club. Between 12.11 a.m. and 1.04 a.m. and around 2.30 a.m., Jordan was last seen on security footage walking by himself near Lower Manhattan. Jordan never returned home and hasn't been found or heard from since. On January 7th, his phone was found near that same club he was at at 1.30 a.m. The authorities reviewed the video footage from outside the club he was at, but didn't see Jordan enter or exit the club at any point. And around 9 a.m., his wallet was found, which contained some cash and all of his credit cards. The police also found no evidence of foul play in Jordan's disappearance. His case is currently active and is still ongoing to this day. This might be one of the scariest things that can ever happen to a human, mainly because can you just imagine going missing and nobody ever finding you or talking to you again? I don't know, the thought about that is just terrifying and hopefully they are found soon. Do you remember Mark and Debbie Constantino from the show Ghost Adventures? Well, they have a tragic story. Mark and Debbie Constantino were a couple for a long time and they gained notoriety as a ghost hunting couple. They were really good friends with the Ghost Adventures crew and thus they were invited out to be a part of episodes and investigations multiple times throughout the Ghost Adventures series. Here are some screenshots of their appearances on the show. Here's Debbie and here's Mark. They were constantly featured on Ghost Adventures and they were one of the couples that appeared all the time. People knew them. But there was trouble behind the scenes. They actually had a very abusive relationship and domestic violence was common between the two of them. Earlier in the year that Debbie was murdered, the police were called by Mark because apparently she had slashed him with a butcher knife, but she would never see court. Then just a week or so before the murders happened, Debbie actually called the police because Mark and the couple's daughter had pulled her out of a car, dragged her inside of a home and beaten her to almost death. Debbie suffered a broken nose and she was afraid for her life and Mark and his daughter were arrested. And since kidnapping is typically a no bond charge, which means that you'll be held in jail until your trial, but a local judge made a tragic mistake and let Mark and his daughter out on bond. A week later, the police were called because a woman came home and found that one of her roommates was dead. And her other roommate, Debbie Constantino, Mark's wife who had moved out of the family home, was missing. Police then tracked Mark's cell phone and found Debbie and Mark holed up inside of an apartment. There was a standoff with SWAT officers, Mark was threatening and yelling things out. And eventually, using explosives, the SWAT team blew open the door to the apartment where they found Debbie dead and Mark dead as well. He had murdered her and then took his own life. Obviously, this was huge news because the couple was on Ghost Adventures so frequently. They were uh, mainstays at paranormal conventions. People knew their website and their work. And it made a lot of people question, was this some sort of darkness that was brought on by paranormal investigating? I personally don't think so. I think that it just had to do with some sort of mental illness and obviously deep issues with domestic abuse and all of that. But either way, it's such a tragic situation. But if you like true crime and you like murder stories, go listen to the podcast I co-host, my fiance, Murder in America. We just covered a brutal murder story from New Orleans, Louisiana, one of our favorite murder stories. The link is in my bio. You can listen for free on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And we've actually been trending lately. Thanks to everybody who's been listening and tuning in. We appreciate you all so much. And obviously that was a tragic story that I just told you guys. So RIP to Debbie Constantino and the other roommate who was killed, who still, I believe, remains unnamed. This 19-year-old boy ate a slug and was then paralyzed for eight years. This is 19-year-old rugby player from Sydney, Sam Ballard. And he contracted rat lungworm disease and spent eight long years paralyzed before dying in November 2018. Sam Ballard was a promising 19-year-old rugby player and he was enjoying a weekend together with his friends in 2010 when he made a random decision that would prove fatal. 
All of them had a little bit of red wine that night, and his friend Jimmy Galvin said a typical garden slug crawled out in front of them. And in a moment of teenage stupidity, perhaps influenced by the wine, Sam Ballard was there to eat the slug, and at first everything seemed fine, the friends carried on as usual. But within a few days time, Sam began to complain of severe pain in his legs. Then he started vomiting and experiencing dizzy spells. When his conditions worsened and he fell weak, his mother rushed him to the hospital. Nobody could have predicted that that hospital visit would result in a 400 day long coma that would paralyze Ballard for 8 years, and would end up eventually killing him. When they first arrived at the hospital, Sam Ballard's mother Katie feared that Sam might have multiple sclerosis, a condition that had affected his father but doctors assured that that was not the case. Sam then turned to his mother and said that he had eaten a slug, and she said no, no one gets sick from that. But as it turned out, Sam Ballard had indeed gotten very, very sick from it. Sam Ballard had become infected with rat lungworm disease, a condition caused by a parasitic worm usually found in rodents, though it can transfer to slugs and snails if they eat the rodents' feces. And when Sam Ballard ate the live slug, it transferred to him. When a human ingests rat lungworm larvae, they penetrate the inner lining of the intestinal tract and work their way into the liver and lungs, then into the central nervous system. In most instances, rat lungworm disease causes only mild symptoms, if any, and most people who contract the illness recover within a matter of days or weeks. However, there are those rare instances where the symptoms are much more severe, and that was the case with Sam Ballard. According to the University of Hawaii, humans are a dead-end host for lungworms. Meaning the parasites don't reproduce in humans, but they do get lost in the central nervous system. Or even move into the eye chamber until they die. And the presence of these parasites can cause severe brain, spinal cord, and nerve damage. And in the case of Sam Ballard, this damage induced a coma that left him bound to a wheelchair and unable to eat without a tube. After Sam woke up from his 420 day long coma, he was completely paralyzed and he now required 24 hour care 7 days a week. He was prone to seizures, unable to go to the bathroom without help or control his body temperature. He spent 3 years in the hospital before being released, just able to operate a motorized wheelchair. But unfortunately the seemingly endless health complications Sam Ballard faced over the course of 8 years took their toll and he sadly passed away in November 2018. And Sam Ballard's final words to his mother were, I love you. This case of Sam Ballard is just extremely sad and honestly unlucky. From what was a harmless prank turned into a nightmare of a life for Sam Ballard. I feel so bad for him and his family and may he rest in peace. On the morning of August 26, 2015, a TV journalist and her cameraman were murdered by a gunman live on air. This is the tragic story of the murders of Allison Parker and Adam Ward. So Allison Parker and Adam Ward were employees of the CBS affiliate WDBJ in Roanoke, Virginia. They had both been working for the news station for a number of years and tragically, Adam Ward actually graduated from Virginia Tech. If you don't remember, Virginia Tech was the site of one of the largest school shootings in American history. On that morning, Allison and Adam were covering a story about the 50th anniversary of a lake. At the time, they were interviewing a woman named Vicki Gardner talking about the upcoming plans for celebration. As Allison was conducting the interview though, a man approached from behind. This man quickly brandished a pistol and in the actual news footage, you can hear the sound of about eight shots firing, followed by Allison screaming and the camera shot going dead. They then cut back to the actual people in the studio and they were confused. They said, oh, we don't know what that was. Maybe it was a car backfiring or some shots fired in the background, but we'll get back to them in a second. What they didn't know though was that when Adam Ward dropped the camera, they caught this image of the shooter. And shockingly, people knew who he was. This is Vester Lee Flanagan II, the murderer behind these atrocious murders, and he himself was a TV reporter. Vester Flanagan had actually been employed by the same TV station that Allison and Adam worked at, even though when he was hired, he decided to go by the professional name of Bryce Williams. In the past, he had been involved with lawsuits with other broadcasting agencies, and people who had worked with Vester in the past knew him to be a volatile and somewhat dangerous individual. And that led to the year 2013 when Vester was fired from the news station that Allison and Adam worked at. He had been there less than a year, but other employees reported feeling extremely uncomfortable around him. On the day that he was fired, Vester didn't take the news so well, and when he was told he was being let go, he lashed out at employees and got violent. The police then had to escort Vester out of the building, and it's been reported that future victim Adam Mord actually videotaped this whole thing going down. 
and that later in the day, Adam and Vester got into a heated argument. So back to the shooting. After that eerie footage was broadcast, people began to worry about Allison and Adam. And when the police were called to the scene, they discovered that they both were dead. Vicki Gardner, the woman that was interviewed, was actually alive, and she was able to relate everything that had happened to the police. Like I said, when people from the news station went back and looked through that live broadcast footage, they recognized the man as Vester Flanagan. And thus, a massive statewide manhunt began for this guy. Authorities were also able to tell that he was the shooter because he had uploaded that eerie first-person perspective clip of him committing the murders to his Facebook at around 11 a.m. that morning. So the police tracked Vester down, they found the rental car that he had rented, and after a high-speed pursuit, he took his own life in the vehicle. Vester, before his death, had actually sent a letter to the news station, and in the letter, he talked about how he was sick of racial discrimination and sexual harassment in the workplace. He felt that he was so angry from the Charleston church shooting that he wanted to do something, and he even claimed that he admired people like Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris from Columbine. So obviously this guy was messed up in the head. He was a disgruntled ex-employee who was fed up with what he saw as the ways of the world, and that led him to commit an atrocious act of violence. Now, I don't recommend you looking up the footage of this happening, but it is out there, and the news stations actually posted some of this back in the day when it all went down. Rest in peace to Allison Parker and Adam Ward, obviously, and I think that this is going to go down in history as one of the strangest murders to ever happen in America. This case made me terrified to go to the cinema. This is the case of the horror in Screen 9. James Holmes was raised in California. His mum was a nurse and his dad was a scientist. From a young age, he was experiencing night terrors and allegedly actually tried to take his own life when he was just 11 years old. He was apparently obsessed with guns and weapons and had dreamed of becoming a mass murderer. Between May and July 2012, he legally bought four guns. Background checks were conducted and he was allowed the weapons. He also bought spike strips, which if you don't know, pop the tires of cars if they chase after you. On July the 19th, just hours before tragedy would unfold, James mailed his notebook to his psychiatrist. Inside the notebook, James detailed his plans to kill. The notebook was actually discovered later on undelivered. Just prior to entering a cinema in Aurora, James rang a crisis line to tell them about his plans to kill. However, the call was disconnected after just nine seconds. At the midnight showing of The Dark Knight Rises, CCTV captures James walking into the cinema. He walks into screen nine, props open the door and then walks back out again. Shockingly, he goes to his car and gets guns out and gas canisters. He re-entered the screen at about 12.38pm and set off two gas canisters. When he entered screen 9 again, he immediately opens fire on the audience, instantly killing 10 people. Two others later died in hospital from their injuries. An additional 70 people were injured. This was an absolutely packed out cinema. James also shot at people as they scrambled to exit the screen. His youngest victim was a six-year-old girl. Witnesses said this all unfolded as there was actually a gunfight on the screen and initially they all thought it was special effects and just part of the film. Police were actually on the scene very quickly after the first 911 call. James surrendered to the police and was arrested in the car park. He was apparently very, very calm when he was arrested and told police that he had booby-trapped his apartment. When police investigated his apartment, this was found out to be true. He was sentenced to 12 consecutive life sentences. This is the UK's most famous missing boy. In September 2007, Andrew Gosden was just 14 years old. He was a very intelligent boy and was top of his class in most classes at school. He was an introvert that usually spent most of his time at home. The day before Andrew went missing seemed completely normal. He went to school, he had some tea, and then he watched some TV. However, on September the 14th, he seemed more irritable than normal. Instead of getting the bus to school that morning like his parents thought he was, he went to a cash point and withdrew 200 pounds. CCTV then captures him walking home where he changed his clothes into a Slipknot t-shirt. When he left the house, he didn't take his charger with him and he also didn't take 100 pounds that he'd saved up. 
He didn't take his passport, but he did take his house key, which indicates he was going to come home. He bought a one-way ticket to London and was last seen leaving King's Cross Station at about half past 11. Frustratingly, the school had actually tried to contact Andrew's parents to say that he hadn't turned up to school that day, but they dialed the wrong number and left an answer phone message on the wrong phone. His family was completely cleared of any suspicion and the family and the school and all of the students went to London and they were handing out loads of flyers. Weirdly, a year after this incident, a man came to a police station to say that he had information about Andrew. Now, the police station was unmanned, so the person spoke to this man just over an intercom system and sent a police officer down there. Mysteriously, by the time the police officer arrived, the person had vanished. This is what Andrew might look like now, just being the age that he may be if he's still alive. Theories about this case is that he may have gone to London to meet up with someone or go to a concert. Was he lured there by somebody with bad intentions or was he just going there for the day, gonna come back and was at the wrong place at the wrong time and somebody did something bad to him? In 2009, the family paid for a search of the River Thames to try and find some sort of closure. The search did find a body, but it wasn't Andrew's. The most up-to-date information that we have on this case is that two men were arrested on suspicion of kidnapping Andrew, but they've actually been released. 